Hey everyone, this is part of a series of films that Rebel Wisdom is putting out about the crisis in sense making. Because I think that the problem of truth, the collapse of institutional authority, and how we come to truth together is right at the core of all of the other problems that we're seeing. I'd recommend you start with part one, which kind of outlined the, the situation as I see it. This is a talk that I gave to a university in America, Lafayette College. I almost called it the intellectual dark web is dead. I kind of wish that I had. And I think it's, it's essential history to understand where we're at now that we're gonna build on over the next few weeks. I started working for Channel 4 News and the BBC, yeah, just over 10 years ago now, 2000 and, 2008. And Rebel Wisdom goes back about uh, 18 months, something like that. Back in 2017, I went out to, I know Jordan Peterson has talked here a while ago, and I went out to, to Canada actually just to go watch one of his lectures and thought, well, I might as well get an interview with him while I'm out there. I'm a journalist, so I applied, got an interview. You came in from where? I came in from London. I ended up making the first documentary about him. I got the interview and then thought, well, no one's actually kind of done a documentary about his thoughts. So I put that together. And then just after I put that out, literally about three or four days after I put that out, he went on Channel 4 News and had that very famous viral interview with Kathy Newman that maybe some of you might have seen. And I used to work with Kathy Newman. So I was actually in the office in Channel 4 News probably about two weeks maybe a month before that interview went out. So I was still freelancing there while I, was a, while I was doing documentaries. And so I was like, this is a really weird position to be in. I, I put out the first documentary about Jordan Peterson and then he kind of rockets to fame on the news program that I used to work for. So I was like, what am I supposed to do with this? And th the irony was a lot of what I talked to him about was synchronicity, this kind of Jungian psychological idea of coincidences that have a deeper meaning. So I was like, this is kind of a weird synchronicity. What am I supposed to do? Um, so for a while, I started trying to negotiate behind the scenes between Kathy Newman and Jordan about maybe doing another interview. Because I don't know if you remember, after the interview, there was a lot of controversy. And uh, Jordan felt that, um, that Channel 4 was sort of spinning, that Kathy was the victim. And there was a lot of stuff going on on Twitter. And it was kind of like watching two people that I knew and knew were good people and trying to sort of bring them back together to have a, a dialogue. And Jordan was really keen and Kathy wasn't. So I was like, okay, that's not gonna work. So in the end, I put together this film called Glitch in the Matrix, looking at the Kathy Newman interview and why it had gone viral and what it said about the media, sort of the balance between the, the mainstream media and the alternative media, what it said about us as a culture. And it became, so Jordan put it onto his channel. It's now got about two and a half million views on his channel. In that film, I, I put in a few criticisms of Channel 4 News and a, a few some criticisms of Kathy Newman, so I knew when I put that out that I was making it much more difficult like to go back into the newsroom, and I kind of knew that I was kind of ending my career with, in the mainstream media by doing it, um, but I just had this sense that there was something more exciting kind of on the other side, and Rebel Wisdom pretty much started through that, that piece. Um, but this is why the, the, the topic of the intellectual dark web is quite close to my heart because I feel that there's some skin in the game then. Like I kind of put all of my chips on Jordan Peterson and the intellectual dark web. And so when that, that first Glitch in the Matrix film was out, or when I was putting that out, literally in the last week or so that I was working on it, I saw this thing called the intellectual dark web on the Dave Rubin show and I thought oh, that's a quite an interesting concept and I put a few lines in the film and then put it into the title. So literally about two weeks after the IDW was named. Fortunately, thanks to YouTube, podcasting and however else you get shows like this one, the mainstream media's stranglehold on information, which really is a stranglehold on your ability to think clearly about the issues of the day, is crumbling at an incredible rate. Now the question is, who and what will replace it? A few months ago, one of my favorite people to sit across this table from, Eric Weinstein, came up with the phrase intellectual dark web to describe this eclectic mix of people from Sam Harris to Ben Shapiro to his brother Brett Weinstein to Jordan Peterson, all of whom are figuring out ways to have the important and often dangerous conversations that are completely ignored by the mainstream. This, this next clip is a set of um, little pieces from 
Jordan Peterson, Heather Hying, and a few other people who've been in our films. It's like a herd of cats, right? <laughs> because, so I've thought about, well, what, what, what unites us to the degree that there's an us, because that's not so self-evident. There's enough of an us so that the name emerged and it's stuck. So, so there's something in common, because otherwise the name wouldn't have stuck, right? You can't name nothing. It, it doesn't work. So what is the intellectual dark web? People in the group tend to reject orthodoxy, tend to reject ideology, tend to be interested in first principles thinking, meaning that uh, if you, you, you don't take something on faith. It's a very smart concept to try to corral a very difficult group of very disparate people into one um, orbit. I would say it is actually the manifestation of the process of thinking that's more important than the conclusions that are generated. You need a group of people who are willing to say, hey, you know, you made a better point. I've changed my mind and I've learned something that I didn't think about. And that kind of um, integrity in a conversation is what characterizes uh, a lot of the internal IDW discussion to me. It's that people agree not on their positions, they may not even agree as to what the facts are, but they usually agree as to what constitutes a conversation. So yeah, the IDW was kind of a coming to consciousness of a conversation that had been growing organically online for quite a while, and then when it, were, when it sort of surfaced, it caught on because a lot of people recognized it as a kind of emergent phenomenon. And one of the people on our channel, Daniel Thorson, talked about Peterson in particular, Jordan Peterson in particular, breaking a conversational seal, which I thought was a really beautiful way of looking at it. In this talk, I'd like to, to talk about kind of what the initial idea of the IDW was and whether it's, it's kind of lived up to its promise, lived up to its ideals and lived up to the kind of initial pitch. And I think it, it both has and hasn't. It's certainly very, very successful. I mean, I'm part of about four or five different Facebook groups set off off the back of the IDW. And it certainly worked as a meme, like it took off. I think Jordan Peterson's framing of it, it, the name stuck, and it certainly refers to something. And that sort of question of what it refers to, I think, is really at the center of this kind of point, because it's, it's often seen, is it, is it a meme? Is it a particular group of people? Is it a way of conversing? There's all of these different ideas, and I think all of them have some truth. And I'd like to kind of go through some of those different uh, ways of looking at it and also talk about what I think it represents. And I think one of those is this sort of alternative media ecosystem. It was kind of the coming to consciousness of an alternative media ecosystem. The, the kind of official coming out of the IDW was this New York Times article that came out in over a year ago. So Barry Weiss is an opinion uh, writer with the New York Times and she wrote this piece that was, was kind of the, the lightning rod. It had already existed, so Sam Harris had talked about it, I think. Eric Weinstein had talked about it, Dave Rubin had talked about it, and this was the New York Times kind of giving it its blessing a little bit. And so the official kind of start in terms of mainstream media was, was about this time. There was a paradox of it kind of shifting, because as soon as it was acknowledged by the mainstream media, it was no longer dark. And so there's a kind of paradox, and it was criticized at the beginning, because people were saying, how can you say that um, Joe Rogan, who's probably the most powerful broadcaster around, is in this dark web. This is ridiculous. So, and that, that's kind of true. A lot of the people in there are some of the most popular and most successful podcasters and media personalities. Like Douglas Murray in the UK is the uh, editor of The Spectator, or the associate editor, editor of The Spectator, the oldest magazine. So there's a kind of paradox. I'll read out the names of all of the people who were in that first New York Times article. So Sam Harris, Eric Weinstein, Dave Rubin, Brett Weinstein, Heather Hying, Jordan Peterson, Ben Shapiro, Douglas Murray, Majid Nawaz, Ian Hersey Ali, Christina Hoff Summers, Joe Rogan, Claire Lehman, and Deborah So. Um, they, and this is interesting because Eric Weinstein is, was the key, so that there were pictures of about, I don't know, maybe 10 altogether of the people who were in there, and these all very sort of heavily stylized pictures. Like the, there's, there's sort of, a, there was a deliberate sort of, um, I don't know, what would you say, almost a mystique around it from the beginning. Um, 
And it's interesting as well that Eric is the first person featured, because Eric is probably is nowhere near as well known as, say, Dave Rubin or Joe Rogan, but that's quite significant, I think. There was a few sort of central thoughts that the IDW was centred around, as, as we heard already in some of those clips, the idea that there are certain things that can and can't be said in the mainstream media, that um, long-form content allows for the exploration of ideas that the mainstream media is now sort of putting into like 30-second sound bites if you're lucky, and, and that just encourages polarization, it encourages um, oppositional thinking, and maybe we can start to kind of have much more nuanced discussions. Um, but also it's formed around the idea that there are certain ideas that are so nuanced and so difficult to discuss. Take sort of gender as an example, like, and that's the, obviously the Kathy Newman, Jordan Peterson discussion, that if you force it into a kind of mainstream media perspective, you just, you, you can't do it. it. It needs longer to explain and a nuanced perspective to be, to be held. Um, and, and also, but there's, there's a much deeper story to the IDW as well that I think we explored quite well in the second film. So we did Glitch in the Matrix 1 and then we did Glitch in the Matrix 2 that was, who's seen that? Has anyone seen that? You're nodding. Have you seen it? <laughs> no, you've seen it. Um, so Glitch in the Matrix 2 was really Eric Weinstein talking about why he thought the, the, the IDW was necessary, where it came from. And he has a, a story that goes back to the 1980s and he, I, I, and I believe him, I believe his story. I think he's, I think he, he's, he's onto something. So he, Eric Weinstein is a uh, mathematician, physicist, and gave a talk to Oxford in, I think 2009, where he, he's got a, a, a theory called geometric unity that he thinks could be a theory of everything. So this is the kind of level that he kind of is looking at the world and thinking about the world on. And his theory is that looking at the institutions um, since the 1980s, what we've done in the West is created institutions that have kept out heterodox thinkers. Where, like, the fresh ideas usually come from the marginal figures, the difficult figures, the ones who won't go along with the consensus, and that we've created um, structures that basically push those people out. And that's what, for him, the IDW is. It's sort of the that's within the media, it's all the people who've been pushed out and all the perspectives that have been pushed out of the media, but his theory about the IDW goes all the way down to that's why we haven't had any advances in physics, that's why biology is stuck. This is something that Brett talks about, like biology has been stuck since the 1960s. Eric says like string theory is a completely wrong turn, it's unverifiable. All of these different areas have become stuck at the same time because of this sort of central idea that we've pushed out all the heterodox thinkers. And we've done it because we don't understand that these difficult characters, of, of which Eric is definitely one, um, and a lot, of, a, lot of his, a lot of his story, a lot of the, 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 the story in Glitch in the Matrix 2 is based around his experience as well, why he, why he felt that his ideas weren't being respected, weren't being um, taken in. And, and why all of these institutions have got stuck at the same time. It's kind of, that the, the, the IDW is this sort of the, the public face of a conversation that needs to happen within a lots of these institutions that have been captured by groupthink, captured by consensus. So that's another sort of deeper layer to it. Um, because sometimes on, on the films that we put out, we get comments on YouTube saying, this was just a kind of, this was just a one-off conversation, this was just, Eric was just throwing something out, you're reading too much into this. It's like, well, maybe, but Eric's possibly reading too much into it as well. Um, and I'm also convinced that, um, again, I don't know this, I, I've obviously spoken a fair bit to, to some of these people behind the scenes, but I don't know this from those conversations. I'm pretty sure that Eric, Eric's a very persuasive guy, and I'm pretty sure that he's persuaded a lot of the other members of the IDW that this is the this is what the overall perspective is. And so it's kind of an existential threat from that perspective. Like there is a kind of, um, yeah, th there's a very powerful narrative underneath a lot of this. So this talk is really, that the central question for me is whether the IDW is, is still creating novelty, is cre still creating newness. Because I, I sense that it was at the beginning of, um, when I first became aware of it, mostly on the Rubin report, you had, conversations between Sam Harris, no sorry, between Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson that seemed to be going into new territory. You had 
conversations between Brett and Eric that seem to be going into new territory. And there's a sort of aliveness to the conversations that I've not seen so much of recently. Uh, and I wonder why that is. I've got a few ideas. Um, I also want to say that what I'm saying now, I'd love this to start a, a conversation. I know that we're, we're kind of doing this for, um, for YouTube as well. These are my ideas. And I, this isn't the final word on it. I'm, I'm sort of putting out some ideas, but this is just sort of starting a conversation about why this might be the case if it's true that it's not creating as much novelty as it did. Um, so, again, sort of coming back to what is the IDW? Is it this group of people or is it a way of interacting? One of my favorite perspectives is from um, a guy called Ryan Bennett, who was central to the IDW meetup in New York after um, a conference there failed to happen. He, he sort of took, so he's quite, he's quite connected with a lot of the people in the IDW. And I really like this. So his concept is, he's a, he's a pro computer programmer, and he says, trying to make sense of the IDW by looking at who's in it is like trying to make sense, sense of the internet by looking at what's on your hard drives. So the, uh, try and see it as a kind of network protocol. So a network, how do you understand the internet? Well, you understand how the computers are talking to each other, what the IP protocols are. That tells you a lot more about what the internet is than the, the contents of what's on it. Um, and I like, I like this as a, as a concept. Um, when you pursue truth instead of power, you're in the IDW and you favor understanding over judgment, value ideas more than identity, you're in the IDW. Again, I think it's really worth thinking about these as ideals and asking kind of how much the, the conversations in the IDW have, have, have um, lived up to these ideals. Um, yeah, I'd like to play the clip number five. This is, this is Brett and Eric on the Rubin Report. Th this for me is one of the most compelling framings of what the conversation of the IDW should talk about and sh the territory it should cover. And once we give up on the idea that anybody on the map today has the answer with respect to the policies that we are supposed to embrace, once we say actually everybody's policies are a failure, if we were to enact uh, the libertarian program, it would fail for game theoretic reasons. If we were to enact the socialist program, it would fail for game Capitalism theoretic reasons. Same thing. Right. So the point is, okay, fresh sheet of paper with respect to policy, now there's a lot for us to talk about starting from values. You can say, we don't actually have the answer. We don't know. And it's very important that the people who are certain be silent. Because they are not the important people at this moment. Yeah, I find that quite a um, compelling framing. And taking, yeah, just sort of saying that, that we need a new form of conversation with a new, a new set of starting points. Um, I want to go back to who is in the, the IDW. Because there's a lot of people who are, who are being framed as being part of it. And I think one of the, one of the a, a good place to start is with uh, Steven Pinker. Does everyone know who Steven Pinker is? Um, so I'll, I'll just recap very, quick, very quickly. He's at, is he at Harvard? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And he's well, a, at MIT and Princeton. Yeah. And he, what's his official? Um, professor of linguistics. Like professor of linguistics. In psychology and linguistics, perhaps? Yes. Yeah? yeah, cool. Um, so Stephen Pinker famously is a famous big head um, academic who keeps writing the same book about how the world's getting better and better and better and how everything is wonderful and we just should be, be grateful for the miraculous times that we live in. Um, and he's also spoken out about some of the same topics that members of the IDW talk about, kind of the ideological capture of the universities and some of those big topics. And he's often linked in with the IDW. And it's, I think it's a really interesting, it's very illustrative about what the IDW is to say why I don't think he is. And I think that, that most of the IDW core would probably not think that he was as well, at least from the way that they explain the IDW. Um, and that's because, and this is a real tension within, within the sort of core of the IDW as well, because and I see it most keenly in sort of Jordan Peterson, but this, are we living in the the best of times or are we living in a world that is kind of degrading fast and we're in an existential crisis um, and I, I hear Jordan Peterson sometimes speak to one side of that and sometimes speak to the other um, but Steven Pinker is clearly on that side of things 
Eric and Brett and I'd say Sam Harris as well and maybe some of the other members of the IDW are very much on the other side and if you watch Glitch in the Matrix 2, the film with, with, with Eric, he frames it very much as a kind of existential crisis and we need to uh, create uh, spaces where we can speak freely because of this existential crisis. Um, so I think that, that for me takes the IDW as it was originally conceived out of the realm of just kind of anti, um, like pro, uh, pro free speech um, movement. It, it's more than that as it's originally kind of conceived. Um, and so now I'm going to move on to kind of given the pitch for what the IDW is meant to achieve and, and, and now I'd like to talk a little bit about what some of the criticisms are and what I consider um, valid criticisms of the IDW. Um, and the first, I'd love to play that clip from, and this was very um, prophetic in a way, because this is, again, Eric and Brett talking on the Rubin report. Uh, and I'm going to come back to Dave Rubin uh, quite a bit later on, because he's such a central figure in the IDW, um, kind of framed very much as the home of the IDW and also host of many of the original conversations. And I think he's so identified with it that the um, flaws in his... Um, the way he conducts himself and now kind of reflecting on a lot of other a lot, the IDW in general um, but this I think is one of the really key points of the dangers of, of this kind of movement maybe there's a missing piece here which is our economic system when you plug it into certain things very directly like journalism I think actually this is your point originally that it's truth seeking which cannot withstand direct contact with market forces. Um, that when you do that, you generate um, artificially feeble truth-seeking mechanisms, and it eventually invades them all. So how hard is it to beat the mainstream news outlets? Not very hard, because they're so bad at delivering... Not your, very hard at analysis. It's very hard to beat them at at some kind of competition right, right competitively right. they're extremely dominant uh -huh. but in terms of what they're trying to deliver they're, they're terrible um, likewise the university system yeah because I think initially the way that the IDW was framed was that because they're not part of a corporate structure because they are they have their own podcasts they uh, have independent audience and their independent means they can be they can avoid that sort of capture by market forces and corporate forces but that's just, not, that's just not the case. I mean, I know from running a YouTube channel, you're constantly aware of what the commenters are saying on your, your channel, and you get to kind of, you feel that as a kind of gravitational force. You know what they like, you know what they don't like. You've started monetizing it, so you know what the, the paying fans want and what they don't. And so it's absolutely the case that um, if you're starting up a podcast, or if you're starting up your own media channel, you're not immune from those forces at all. And you're not immune from... Um, so market forces, you can kind of look at kind of financial forces, but you can also look at it like sex, power, uh, and all, all those other social dynamics are also market forces. What you're doing for kind of rep for reputation, and that starts to kind of interfere with searching for truth as well. Just, just the, the fact that there is a comment thread and knowing what the audience like and what they don't like you, you can i mean if you you'd have to not be human to not to not feel that in some way yeah 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 i feel it too and um i think we should be honest about that and, and be able to laugh at it a little bit and i think to sort of zoom out a little bit of you know you and i have talked a lot before and i keep coming back to this line of uh, the danger, the dangers that lurk in something like the IDW conversation, or even followers and fans of it, is you know once this mistake that I, that I've come to uh, to notice or, or basically profess is that there seems to be a trend of people who think the moment that they have rejected bad philosophy or a bad philosophy, it also means they've rejected bad psychology, and they really have nothing to do with each other. It doesn't mean you're not susceptible to the lures of status and sex and money and all of these other things. And even some, if someone rejects a political leaning, being like, oh, I've noticed that the left is really wacky and has gone overboard, and look, like I'm, I, I woke to this in sort of the red pill way, or either side of that, if whatever your political epiphany is, that doesn't mean you've escaped the normal trappings that we all deal with 
of weak psychology and and they they relate but they don't they don't they don't correlate the way that I think a lot of people tend to to jump the gun and think they have um, and that goes for the personalities in the IDW that goes for the big names that we all know who are on stage that goes for people like you and I who are trying to sort of tell the story of these people it goes for people following it I think we all have to just sort of be honest about that again laugh about it a little bit it's if there's anything that binds us as humans together that would be a great thing to sort of you know <laughs> find common ground even with your political enemy is like we're all susceptible to these kind of things we should admit that and then what you do with it is is really important also once you once you identify yourself as they did with the idw being a thing you start to create aligned incense incentives like they're they're talking uh, speaking tours together or book deals or all of that sort of stuff that starts to come in and then especially on something like twitter where you're kind of like is innately tribalizing, you're then sticking up for each other and those kind of factors. So you, you start to create a tribe around an anti-tribal um, ideology. You, you, it sort of becomes a little bit paradoxical. And, and I think that paradox um, has been playing out quite a bit. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, one of the things that I think the IDW at its best, or the members of the IDW at their best do, is create a sort of high resolution critique of um, culture, like cultural movements. Gender was a perfect example that I talked about before. Um, like those conversations have to be had with real nuance and real, um, real delicacy. And they're very easily, as soon as they come down to a lower level, a low resolution perspective, then I think you're, it's almost like a lie. Um, the high resolution perspective is, is very illuminating. The low resolution one is just a cliche. And I think at their best, some of the people in the IDW do hold that, that um, high resolution critique, but at their worst, I think they do uh, slip to a low resolution critique. Um, like Jordan Peterson at his best is very high resolution at his worst. He kind of, it comes down to very sort of, it can be quite simplistic, kind of reacting against the excesses of the left and it just becomes quite kind of cliched. Um, Dave Rubin, who's highly identified with the IDW, like his, his whole thing is like how the left has gone insane. And that's pretty much the whole frame that he, that he puts everything through. And I think that's, that's not searching after truth. I mean, if you're going to search after truth, I think you need to have a, a more high resolution critique than that. Also, this sense of tribalism kind of going against tribalism, has, has it created a new tribalism? I think we've got the, the piece here that Kathy Young yeah. wrote for Quillette, um, where she, she looked at what is the unifying factor behind the people who are seen as being part of the IDW. And it's often been co uh, called reactionary. Um, and I, I know that people in the IDW wouldn't like that phrase, but I think there is some truth in it. I think they are reacting to something. And the question is whether it's something that needs to be reacted to, like how widespread is um, the ideological capture of um, institutions now, and how dangerous is that? Um, and the biggest criticism of the IDW, I think, and Kathy points to that in this piece, is that they are becoming tribalist themselves. Just there are these, these huge forces that pull you towards tribalization, especially on social media and um, particularly on Twitter where most of this conflict is, is happening. So, so a lot of the commentary on the IDW is kind of asking, okay, what is the thing that unites the people within it? And I mean, obviously part of that is gonna be sort of a resistance to extreme kind of ideological uh, thinking on the left, what you might call kind of woke culture. And there's, there's a question of what that actually means and whether that is the new dividing line in culture. Yuri Harris had a few articles in Quillette around that. And Eric Weinstein has kind of uh, agreed with that and he says that the main dividing line is this upgrade to the left. If you break progressivism or the left or, or whatever you want to call it uh, into the traditional liberal core of the left and then uh, you augment that with a fairly recent extremely aggressive upgrade which appears to be willing to attack reason, civility, as agents of oppression, you know, or tools of oppression. Um, I think that that upgrade is really what is it, 
at issue and a question what is it what is being questioned and if you believe that, that upgrade that extremely postmodern um adjustment to classically progressive positions if you think that is now the new dominant left and it's not going away you probably take a fairly dismissive attitude towards the entire left of center uh, canon of thought and i would say that there are members of the of the idw who believe that uh this current aggressive strain has displaced classically liberal or classically progressive positions uh which will never return and that we now need to deal with the fact that that upgrade uh is permanent and those people have probably um decided that they are going to abandon any hope in a left of center position well if i held that position that that upgrade if you will that marginal difference um in a level of aggression and willingness to attack reason and data and evidence and itself in favor of tying people in knots logically and epistemologically um if i thought that was permanent i would understand exactly why these people were completely abandoning any kind of uh, high resolution view of the left now it happens that i understand why they're saying that but i disagree i believe that many people are fairly moderate and liberal in their views and are going through a period uh, akin to the mccarthy era which i've called left carthyism in which it's very dangerous to simply say the obvious which is when you're attacking reason or one of two genders or uh concepts as abstract as patriarchy or anything like that you probably made a fairly significant wrong turn somewhere um in your thinking so this is another another frame that i find particularly useful to understand kind of the culture war dynamic at the moment a friend of mine peter limberg wrote this piece a white paper about culture war 2.0 saying that if culture war 1.0 was about left versus right what we actually have now is a kind of fragmentation of the culture war where we have maybe i don't know exactly how many maybe 12 different what he called mimetic tribes fighting each other and he he did a spreadsheet with all of their mimetic tribes like what they believe and how a lot of the the real fighting that we're seeing at the moment is kind of in the left like between different tribes on the left or between different tribes on the right and he yeah really worth checking this one out maybe we can send you some of the links after after the talk um and in this he also talked about the value of what he called mimetic mediation which is like how do you mediate between the different warring tribes and i think that's a really really valuable concept that i'd like to see kind of being spread a bit more because that that's another criticism of the idw that i think's worth making is i don't see them reaching out so much to people in other tribes and looking at kind of negotiating between them if i don't see much strategy in having people from different tribes onto their shows for example and dialoguing with them i th- i see them mostly commenting and talking to people within their particular tribe um and then there's often kind of defenses where people talk about bad faith you can't talk to that person they're a bad faith actor um i would i would probably i'd i'd suggest that um yeah mimetic mediation is something that finding someone who is in one of the tribes but is able to able to dialogue so i think people right in the center of those tribes are probably unreachable but there's always people on the outside who are open to dialogue and open to to communication and i i don't see that happening so often the other criticism of the idw i would say is the need to embrace criticism and there's a there's a dialogue between eric weinstein and sam harris saying that they're both getting worse they feel that they're getting worse because most of the criticism that they've had so far has been really low quality and that they need better better quality criticism yeah and the other point is that the idw was very specifically framed as an environment a group of people who would come together discuss things and potentially change minds and i genuinely can't think of a single example where someone in the idw has changed their mind over anything significant over what the last 18 months or so since the IDW came along and if the IDW is a project that is able to kind of carve out a beachhead and then potentially create an a, a space in culture for people to cha- have conversations and change their minds if they're not even doing that within the IDW itself how on earth are they going to do that or model that for everyone else
in to Eric's point, probably about what what you want in sort of in any system, you want a method of error detection and correction. David Deutsch is my favorite thinker. I think I tweet about him more than anyone else. I'm a huge fan of David Deutsch's work, and he sort of pins that um, sentence as may, if there's a commandment of the universe that you could try to derive from the universe itself in the famous is off distinction, it would be something like that, that uh, <clears throat> sustaining and building the systems to detect and correct errors, of course you have to decide what an error is, and that's a different philosophical question, is the most important thing. And for that, Eric's right, for thinkers, you, what you want is an incubator that can detect and correct errors. Um, and if it becomes tribal and it has biases that start building within it, that, it, that there's certain errors that just are never detected. Maybe I'm pointing to some of the errors of like, you know, pretending that we're animals that suddenly don't want sex because we're sitting in an IDW room or something like that. You, you, want, you want an ability to detect and correct errors and open discussion in, in, a, in a culture of, of criticism is, um, is important to uphold. So in, in that respect, tribal thinking, if it becomes, um, if it becomes unable to, to correct itself, is, is, I would say, an objective wrong and an objective evil in the universe to sort of borrow some more Deutschian language. And, and central to that, I think, is, is Dave Rubin, because Dave Rubin has been center. Who here knows who, does everyone here know who Dave Rubin is? Rubin Report. Um, so I've got a little clip. Um, so a little clip of the interview that I did with, with Dave um, in the summer, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, I guess if there's a physical center of the intellectual dark web, it's right here. I mean, it's in my garage, because I think this is where, not where the ideas all started, but at least where most of the connections between the people started. And, you know, people ask me my role in this whole thing, and whether it is a thing at all, you know, whether it is some sort of card-carrying organization, or it's this loose affiliation, or whatever it is, uh, I think my role in it is I've been a little bit of the connective tissue between the people. And, and the criticism that I've seen is that you don't push back hard enough against people when they maybe deserve it, that you give an easy ride to people. Listen, I would say I'm interviewing people the way I like to interview them. I like to sit across from somebody, look them in the eye, and figure out what their ideas are. The bigger you get, the more relevant you get, the more haters are going to come out, but the more that legitimate criticism will come out too. And again, I address this all the time. What do you think is the most legitimate criticism? It's not really for me to say what the legitimate criticism of me. If someone wants to say that they don't like the way I interview or that I don't ask hard enough questions or something like that, well, I suppose that is a legitimate criticism of me. It's not the way I like doing my business. And, you know, if you don't like what I'm doing, then I would say you don't have to watch. I, I wanted to interview him, and I've been wanting to interview him for a while after seeing those first Rubin Report uh, shows. And, but when I started researching in the, in the run-up to it and I was just looking at some of his old, old programs, I was thinking oh, there's something a little bit off here. And it's not just... So Ruben famously interviews controversial figures and that's fine. I, I think that's a valuable thing to do, but only if you're giving the audience the necessary information to make up their own minds about who these people are. Ask them, push them about certain things that they've said. So in the, in the research for it, and then subsequently, there's an amazing series of films by a guy called Timber on Toast called Dave Rubin's Battle of Ideas, which is a fantastic watch. It's, four, it's literally four hours of forensic analysis of what the Rubin Report does and how it does it that is really a, an amazing piece of work. A running theme which I want to be constantly shining a spotlight on throughout this whole thing is exploring how well the Rubin Report does in achieving its main goal of fostering open and honest conversations about ideas. Yeah, Timber, it's really good to catch up. I really enjoyed your, your films and it looked like you put an awful lot of work into making them. Why did you go to so much work, like four hours, uh, just based on the Rubin Report? The main reason was um, I could see that there was a lot of criticism emerging online, but that people would rarely provide substantive examples of the things that they were accusing Dave of. Um, and I think when you've got that criticism without examples or without like justification, it does come across as quite 
sort of malicious and it doesn't seem like it's it's like good faith um so my main motivation in making the videos was so i knew the examples because i followed dave for a long time like from the beginning of his show like 2015 um i'd been there for all the kind of example interviews as they've, as they've come up the ones that i sort of pointed out and i thought if i assemble these in a, a tight structure that people can easily follow people who have watched him and people who have never watched him then at least when these criticism come up people can look into them and know what they're based on if after watching my videos they have no problem still with the interview style or the way he conducts things that's fine uh, but at least then they that they know what it's based on so so how would you summarize those criticisms so i'd say firstly that he never pushes back on guests therefore whenever there is an idea presented that needs to be investigated into like its strengths and weaknesses the audience aren't given a chance to explore that because they don't see the counter argument or the challenge and the other criticism would be that he sanitizes and savory characters um not by platforming them which i think is the straw man kind of argument of what it is i think he sanitizes them by presenting them as something they are not whenever there's a chance to get to the bottom of some sort of controversial thing they've said in the past he skirts around it or does something to obfuscate it i think those are the two main criticisms you almost have to go to that level to really sort of to to see what's being done um but, but generally, he'll have Stefan Molyneux on or Tommy Robinson, who's a famous kind of um, sort of street fighting politician from the UK. Katie Hopkins is a provocateur, a journalist. This guy, Tommy Sotomayor, who is sort of famous for being quite anti-Semitic. And he, he doesn't ask them those kind of questions, do, doesn't, doesn't put their words to them. If Dave's interviews expose that people at the forefront of his struggle against the authoritarian left were xenophobic or misogynistic or white supremacists or rape apologists, it would deprecate the viewer's perception of the show's value and their connection to its emotional core. Dave therefore has to carefully sidestep around his guests, asking softball questions, helping them to deliver blows against their opponents, and flattering them at every step of the journey to ensure that they are shown in the best possible light. The dishonest framing of guests which we see in episodes of The Rubin Report isn't a glitch. It's a feature. A key selling point. Discussing controversial topics is all well and good, but it's worth very little if you don't combine it with debate and challenging questions to put the guests on the spot and get to the root of their ideologies. That would take actual courage, intellectual curiosity and rigour, and it's definitely not an easy thing to do. You know, it might mean that your guests refuse to do your show again, it might mean that they stop inviting you along to do talks alongside them on stage, and it might mean that all those invitations you're getting to speak for right-wing groups conveniently dry up. But maybe that's what would need to happen in order for you to deliver the honest, worthwhile exchange of ideas which you keep telling us that your show is all about. As, as a journalist, I felt I had to push him on that and had to ask him those questions. Um, and what I've seen since is that he refuses to engage with, with people who criticize him or ask questions about the show. I've seen him do that a lot on Twitter. And he claims that no one, he claims that left wingers don't want to go on the show. He, he, he has all of these right wingers on the show because they want to come on and the left wingers don't want to come on. Hey Dave, um, so I've been watching your program since about like early time in high school, now I'm in college, so it's been a while. But um, one thing that I really liked, uh, something that you talked about here was the difference between uh, diversity of thought and uh, diversity of identity. Sure. Now, the thing with a diversity of thought is I feel like that's a problem you actually perpetuate on your show because the only time you really have left-wing guests are when they're members of the intellectual dark web, such as Harris or Weinstein, and they're only there for the bulk of the time to uh, talk about the regressive left. And so I pretty much wanted to ask you, why won't you have Sam or Sam Cedar on? Yeah, uh, he's recording it too. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the guy's just, he's just a dishonest player who's just lied about me repeatedly. Like, I'm not going to do it. So would you be willing to have Natalie Wynn of ContraPoints or David Pakman or Kyle Kalinske? All of these are progressives who have... Yeah, I'm not, in principle, I'm not against having any of them, but I'm not going to have people that attack me personally. I think it's pretty obvious if you watch what I did up here. Like, I don't attack people personally. I'm happy to talk about ideas. You're going to go after me personally if you're going to lie about me and slander me and things like that. Like, it's just not the game I'm playing. There's no win in it for me. You know, I have a certain set of rules when it comes to talking to people and how I sort of behave as a public person. So 
he wasn't very happy with the interview that I did. Um, had very a little contact with them afterwards, and then it kind of shut down completely. And I've I've heard now that that has happened to a lot of other people who've tried to raise any any concerns with him. Um, and I. I think it's worth highlighting this because I think it illustrates quite a lot about the dangers of the IDW, this sort of slipping down to a tribal perspective and also I, I genuinely think that this, he's obviously not the only person that does this but I think he's probably the most high profile person who does. What I see him doing on Twitter is framing anyone who criticises him as being ba motivated by bad faith or kind of a bad person. Basically a uh, Quillette which is run by Clara Lehman, who's a former guest of mine, who has been very uh, friendly and nice to me uh, on my show and in all of our private exchanges, uh, has done about four hit pieces on me recently, um, where they're really trying to single me out, uh, out of the IDW crew, that I'm somehow the worst because I sit down and, and talk to some people that they don't like, and I talk to these people on the right, and I don't question them exactly as they want, and all of these things. Uh, and they keep just writing piece after piece. Now, I got a, a shit ton of haters these days, which really is just the sign that I'm doing something good. I mean, it really is. And then the, li the good liberals are just freaking out right now. And that's also why they're coming down on me, because I've left and I've survived. And you got to extract a pretty heavy price on a guy like that. Because if you look at my resume, if this is a back of a baseball card, and you look at my numbers, you'd be like, no, this guy has to be with them. Yeah. But I'm not. But you're and not. because of that, they're like, whoa, we can't just let him walk. We got to break his knees. You need to go and support him and be part of what he's doing because he's under the gun now. Okay, Understand this. He's being attacked by some of the most vitriolic and dangerous people on earth. And if you guys do not support him now, then you're part of the problem. It's, it's, the, it's akin to you guys sitting on the side and watching your neighbors be slaughtered because they haven't come to your house yet. And this is the, the last message that I probably have for where I think the IDW can go wrong and what I think it needs to do is just to actually embrace criticism. Embrace criticism, have the critic on the shows, have some, maybe have some even kind of heated discussions if needed. And what I see them doing far too often is, is only talking to the people who already agree with them about most of the central stuff. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slip in a slight curveball here, and I don't know how this is going to land. Um, this is uh, Ken Wilbur, who um, Brand Brandon has been getting into quite a bit recently. Okay, so Ken Wilber is a philosopher. He created something called Integral Theory in about the 90s. So it had a real um, high point in the 90s and early 2000s. Al Gore was a real fan of Integral Theory. So there's a kind of sliding doors moment with the Florida election was um, if Al Gore had become, become president, we might be living in a very different world now if it wasn't George Bush. But, um, but Ken Wilber has this theory about how consciousness evolves that I think is really, really useful as a frame to see where the IDW um, sometimes slips into a very simplistic narrative and when it sometimes goes beyond that. So this is a little graphic that um, I made to go at the beginning of a film that I did with Ken Wilber and I think it's useful. Jordan Peterson has become a global celebrity by weaving together mythology, science, philosophy and religion into a compelling theory of everything. One of the most influential philosophers of the last decades did something similar. Ken Wilber is the creator of Integral Theory, another attempt to pull together much of the world's knowledge and spiritual traditions into a theory of everything. Integral Theory gained a big following in the 90s and 2000s and remains influential. After serious health problems over the last decade, Ken Wilber is now returning to the conversation. What do these two hugely influential thinkers have in common? Where do they disagree? And what can they learn from each other? A lot of times when it comes to Jordan Peterson, it's not that I'll disagree with much of what he says. I, I, I agree with much of what he says. It's some of the things that he leaves out. I find this a little bit interesting because he's clearly an integral thinker. To get the most out of this film, we'll need to introduce a little integral terminology. At the core of integral theory is the idea that cultures and societies go through specific levels of development in the same way as individuals do, becoming more sophisticated as they develop or grow up. It's an idea that's common to developmental theorists, including Peterson's favourite, Jean Piaget. 
you move from one knowledge structure to the next one which includes the previous one and is better and it's better because it covers more territory that's how you know it's better it does the same thing the old tool does plus some additional things so it's a definition of better integral theory represents this development as a spiral in this film we'll mostly be talking about amber tribalism ethnocentric authoritarian which first emerged about 5,000 years ago. Orange, modern values, the rational self, that emerged 300 years ago with the liberal democracies and the beginning of universal values. Green, the values of relativism, multiple perspectives, dialogue and consensus, human rights, sometimes called postmodern, which emerged fully in the 1960s. If they're healthily integrated, they support each other, but each of them can believe that their way of looking at the world is the only true way, and then they are mutually exclusive. For Wilbur, the incomprehension between these worldviews is what's causing many of the worst excesses of the culture wars. Above these levels, Wilbur says, is another level called integral or second tier. From this perspective, it's clear that each of the previous ways of seeing the world has value and needs to be integrated. Um, so I don't know if this is really confusing or, or helpful, but basically the idea is, so Ken Wilber's map, and I've, I've met a few people who talk about this as an integral OS, like an integral operating system, is very, very helpful to understand, especially with what happened when, so green postmodern was uh, civil rights, feminism, the, the idea that before then you had orange values, which was basically there's one way of looking at the world, it's based on science, it's based on kind of, um, it's based on a sort of single perspective. And then what we had coming in in the 60s and, and developing after it was the idea that there are multiple perspectives that are not being included. And that's, that's an advance. That, that realization is actually an advance on the previous one because there are perspectives that are not included, there are voices that are not being heard. Bringing those in is really essential. But what can happen and what's been happening um, over the last 10, 15 years by Wilbur's um, uh, perspective is that if you, if you forget that or what you can end up with is just a cacophony of voices, like you lose the idea of truth altogether. Like tru every, all truth is relative, so you've just lost the idea of any kind of central truth. You've lost the idea, all truths just become perspectives. And then what you end up in is kind of narcissism and nihilism. And if that's where we are, and I think that there's some truth to that, um, that the theory is that these, these, these levels of development, um, they, they emerge and then they become pathological just before we move on to a new level of development. Um, so I think from this perspective, what the IDW is generally doing is pointing out most of the flaws with green, with postmodern, with saying, there is a truth, um, it's not just about perspective, and the danger is that a, I think at its worst the people in the IDW don't see that that is actually a, a, a positive value, that it is valuable to see different perspectives. Um, and the idea with integral, the teal one at the top, is that its, it's second tier is considered um, a an evolution of consciousness where you can actually start to see that all of these different um, levels before have some value. And that's where I think at its best the thinkers on um, the intellectual dark web, and I'd include someone like Jonathan Haidt here as well, he, he's very good at seeing that most of our political beliefs are temperamental. So thinking that someone's kind of worse or better based on their political beliefs is like you're, you're judging someone for the way that they're wired rather than uh, just their, for, for what they think. So th there's, a, there's an e-book that um, Ken Wilber wrote around this called Trump and a Post-Truth World that I would, would really highly recommend if anyone's interested to know, know more about this, this frame. And my, my sort of final thought is that Eric in Glitch in the Matrix 2 and in his sort of framing of the, the idea of the IDW was saying that it's needed to, because of the corrupting effect of groupthink and aligned incentives within institutions, and the kind of paradox is that by creating the IDW, I think they've actually made themselves subject to some of those same forces. 
and, and that's a kind of paradox of in the naming and creation of it, it sort of has allowed it to be captured by some of those same forces. So thank you very much for, for listening. We're going to have a few questions and a Q&A now. Rebel Wisdom was set up to make sense of the world at a deeper level than the mainstream media. It was built for these times of crisis and change, which is why we want to do what we can to meet the challenge of the times. More films, and also for our Rebel Wisdom members, weekly sense-making calls with our amazing interviewees. And also, we're introducing the Wisdom Gym, a place to practice some of the skills that we've talked about on the channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon.